Hello and welcome to the Afghanistan uh, Security Dialogue. We are not in Herat this year. Unfortunately, we're all, because of COVID-19, sitting in our homes uh, uh, all over the world. I'm in Delhi, uh, Ambassador Robin Rafel, former Assistant Secretary of State for South Asia and former U.S. Ambassador is in Washington, D.C. Uh, Dr. Marvin Weinbaum of the Middle East Institute, he runs the uh, Pakistan Afghanistan program is also in Washington, D.C. Ambassador Amar Sinha, uh, former India's ambassador to Afghanistan, is in Delhi like me. And Mr. Emmett Shuja, in the office of Afghanistan's National Security Council, is of course in Kabul. So, welcome all of you. Good morning, good evening. Uh, adab, um, namaste, and um, Let's and, and our session this evening at the, um, at the uh, Afghanistan um, Institute of Strategic Affairs Herat Dialogue is, a, is on the prospects of Afghanistan, India, US trilater trilateral cooperation. I'm Jyoti Malhotra, I'm a journalist here in New Delhi and I work with the print. Um, Ahmad, may I ask you to launch this session? Just a few days ago, Kabul University witnessed a horrendous terror attack in which 20 students were, 22 students were killed and several, several others injured. Uh, while we all grieve for, the, uh, for all those who, are, who passed away and, and hope that, that the injured will get better soon, can you tell us who is behind this? Why are these terror um, uh, incidents still taking place considering that the peace talks between the Taliban and the Afghan government have been launched in Doha some weeks ago. Thank you, Jyoti. It's good to see you after Raisina earlier this year in Delhi, but it's also good to see everybody else, including Ambassador Rappo, whom I met at last year's Herat Security Dialogue. And of course, it's good to see Ambassador Sinha and Dr. Marvin Weinbaum. Uh, before I answer your question. I just wanted to note that we're recording this on the, no the 9th of November 2020 because it's possible that events are moving fast and people might see this a little bit later on. Right. Uh, the attack on Kabul University has shaken the entire country and I think it is fair to say that it's also shaken the entire world. The barbarity and the criminal disregard for the lives of students, unarmed civilians in an education center is nothing short of absolutely shocking. But of course, it's not the first time that this has happened. The attack on the 25th of October this year uh, on the Kausare Danish Educational Center that has left even more students dead and injured. Other attacks in previous years. This year alone, by the ninth or the seventh, oh, sorry, the ninth or the eighth month of the year, uh, the Taliban have either completely damaged or partially destroyed 131 schools across the country. Uh, but there's a lot of confusion about whether the Taliban did this or ISIS did that or who did it and who didn't do it. And I want this to be clear. Daesh has been all but decimated across much of Afghanistan and its capability of staging attacks like this with such frequency has long been significantly degraded. The pattern of attack that we saw at Kabul University, the tragic attack, really matches that of the Taliban who attacked the American University of Afghanistan in a similar fashion in 2016. Because the Taliban have a historic pattern of lying about their crimes. And this whole talk about reduction in violence and, and, and whatever has given them plausible deniability because now they can undertake these attacks and deny that they were involved in, the, in these attacks. Daesh and ISIS is a conveniently good boogeyman for that. The Afghan government, Figures, but also, as we saw, the UN assistance mission in Afghanistan's figures also show that the, the deaths of civilians from Taliban have actually increased compared to past years. And one wonders why. Because what the Taliban did in Helmand, where they tried to take over a provincial capital but were repelled decisively, shows that their intent is really not constructive, not even for their own commitments under the US Taliban deal, which they purport to support and have been calling on the U.S. to improve its compliance with the timelines of that deal. Right. So with that context, let me answer the, the other part of the question, which is if the Taliban are trying to play the role of a spoiler by making it hard for Afghanistan to continue the negotiations, they are not succeeding. 
because our Afghan national defense and security forces have orders to take quick and decisive action against the Taliban provocations, no matter where across the country it happens. And our negotiating team has also strict orders from the president that we are not walking away and we are not giving in on the key demands. Mm -hmm. So if the Taliban want to fight and talk, we are working with our international partners to pressure them uh, on the battlefield diplomatically, but we are also engaging in a serious way on the talks. We are okay. not walking away. Okay. Ambassador Robin Rafel, Ahmed Shuja has virtually, or not just virtually, but directly blamed the Taliban for these attacks against uh, educational institutions in Kabul and elsewhere in Afghanistan. But if, you know, as an American sitting in Washington, D.C., you know the region really well. Now, why would the Taliban um, carry out terror attacks, killing Kabuls and Afghanistan's young people, the youth of the country, when it's engaged in peace talks with the government of that country? Well, Jyoti, first of all, uh, thanks very much um, uh, for chairing this session, and I'm really happy to be participating. Only sorry that we're not all in, in uh, Herat. Right. Uh, to answer your question, you know, first of all, I have to say I'm not privy to any of the intelligence which would uh, help me to understand who and why committed uh, this absolutely tragic attack on Kabul University. I have to say it was heartbreaking to read the stories of these, these various students and so on and so forth. So I, um, it was absolutely horrific. I don't know, you know who would have done it. It doesn't make sense to me that the Taliban who are so keen they say on international recognition and are so proud of the deal that they made with the United States and who uh, by many measures hope to get a deal whereby the US troops will leave Afghanistan would be doing this. I don't know. Um, and I, you know, I don't know who did it, uh, but it certainly was horrific. And what I would say is that what it points to is the urgency of getting this peace process really going, um, not just on the procedural issues, but on the substantive issues, uh, so that, that the people of the country and the government and the Taliban and all stakeholders can have faith that this might actually lead somewhere. Because what worries me the most is without a sense of urgency there will be drift and, you know, the worst um, uh, the drift back to civil war and so on should, could come. So right. um, that's what I would say. It's very urgent. And I hope the new Biden administration um, makes that point to all sides. Okay. Ambassador Amar Sinha, um, I've been remiss in introducing you. You're also a member of India's National Security Advisory Board. You've been in uh, Afghanistan as India's ambassador. Uh, some years ago, but for, for a few years, and you know that country really well. Now, two questions to you. There is a new uh, administration in Washington, D.C., a new president-elect, and his team is just coming in. Why do you think that these horrifying um, terror attacks uh, are continuing to take place in Kabul and all around Afghanistan when the when talks are underway. It's the same question, actually, that I'm asking all of you. But I'm asking you to explain to us, perhaps from an Indian point of view, but also as, as an observer of the, uh, of the Afghan situation. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you um, uh, to AISS and to you and to all my uh, co-panelists. You know, it's, it's, uh, as everybody said, it's very difficult to uh, really guess what Taliban's motivation is. Uh, as an observer, I can say that it's very clear that these are uh, groups within Taliban which are not on the same page. And what is happening is perhaps because of that, that there are elements within Taliban which really want to wreck uh, whatever chances there are of moving towards peace. Uh, of course, I, because of the elections also, I thought that they felt that there was an interregnum where they could really push their advantages, and you saw that attacks in Helmand. In fact, I think there was an attack in Kandahar where they're really trying to take districts. But the horrific attacks that they have done on Afghan people, I think it is basically to break the will of Afghan government, uh, because one hasn't seen this sort of barbaric attacks uh, before, of course. 
uh, since the talks have begun, uh, it is, uh, has been repeated with a sickening sort of uh, uh, regularity. Regularity, absolutely. Uh, my, I don't know what Taliban wants. You see, most of the demands have been met in terms of the prisoner release. Mm -hmm. My own hunch is that perhaps they also want Americans to give them the other concession which was mentioned in the list, which is basically delisting all of them. And there I particularly think that the Haqqanis, which are in a very uh, strong position, uh, I think uh, could be behind these attacks. But this is, of course, guesswork. I think the Afghan intelligence agencies would have more information. But the tactics is exactly the same. These names and these flags are more of convenience. Uh, so uh, I think it's, it's a difficult situation. And uh, I think that nothing will happen till they see. Of course, now that President Trump has gone, Taliban will have to reassess the commitment of the new administration to the agreement. So I think they will not uh, move forward. Uh, second, they will have to also see whether Biden administration sticks with it or has a change of plans. So I think uh, we are entering a, a phase of turbulence and uh, uncertainty. Um, uh, Dr. Weinbaum, my question to you, one, one question, of course, remains the same. Do you agree with your co-panelists that it's the Taliban that's behind these attacks? But the same question, no. When, no. The, when the, Afga the Taliban is in talks with the Afghan government, isn't it foolish of them to kill Afghans, fellow Afghans, I may add, and with the Biden administration now taking power in Washington, are things going to change in any way? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you're viewing this in terms of their perhaps strengthening their bargaining position. Uh, I, I don't see it that way. I see these attacks as part of a larger uh, strategy here, and that is to undermine not just the Kabul government, but also to instill in the people of Afghanistan the sense that the government cannot defend them, cannot, cannot secure them against the Taliban. Uh, I see this as a much larger uh, action on their part. Uh, I think that they are committed to the peace process, that is to, to negotiating, as long as foreign troops remain in the country. Uh, after that point, uh, I think that we will probably see a much more aggressive Taliban uh, I don't accept the notion that they are disunited on this. I think that clearly what we've seen is surprising unity among the Taliban, both politically, but also militarily. They've been able to control those commanders. They may not always agree, but they've been able to do so. So really what we have to see this as something that the Taliban is doing because they can. The American agreement with them effectively gave them the license here to be able to do a great deal militarily mm -hmm. and still not in any way jeopardize, jeopardize that treaty. Both that agreement, both sides, both the U.S. and the Taliban, want to see it now. The U.S. Why? Why? At least under Trump, because we're anxious to get out. And this is our cover for getting out. But the Taliban, because they are combining, combining both their actions politically with their actions militarily. And together, this, I believe, is their pathway to what is, for all of them, their ultimate objective, which is dominance in the country and presumably in the form of an Islamic emirate. Who is the brain behind the Taliban? Ambassador, uh, Dr. Weinbaum, you just said that they are, they are combining the, mil the military aspects with, the, with their political strategy. But who is the brain behind Well, there, there is no single... I mean, when Mullah Omar was around, you could say there was. But there is a, a coterie of people here, uh, hardliners for the most. They took over the negotiations. Like who? Uh, well, look... Uh, we usually use Sirajuddin uh, as an example. Sirajuddin Haqqani? Are you talking about Sirajuddin? Haqqani, yes, yes. Uh, okay. uh, certainly the Haqqani faction in the Taliban is very important. Uh, uh, you know, it's take the leadership. They pushed Stanikzai out here. 
Uh, they brought in, a, I say, a much more hardline group, but it really doesn't matter because in the end, the difference between the more pragmatic and the more militant types here is not that they have a different end game in mind, but they have different approaches. One would like to see a more diplomatic approach. The other, the other says, uh, no, we can pursue the military because that the payoff there is greater. But in any case, these work in combination. Right. Um, uh, Ahmed Shujab, my question to you next is, uh, if, we, if we take off from Dr. Weinbaum's remar remarks about uh, the Taliban playing good cop, bad cop, you know, Sirajuddin Haqqani on the one hand, uh, somebody else on the other, it doesn't really matter, as he's saying. Do you agree that this is the case? Or the question to you is, who do you think is the brain behind the Taliban killing young Afghans? Look, that's, that's an excellent question. And I think if you, if you look at the interviews of these Taliban officials from Doha, and then if you confirm accounts of interactions between Western diplomats and the Taliban in Doha, you will see that there is a kind of raw, uncultured or un -art, sort of a sense of, um, sense of naiveness about their vision of how the world works that is entirely inconsistent with the sleek production of their statements in five, six languages, but also the, the videos and other things they produce. And I think that tells you significantly, uh, 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 significant amounts of information about who actually does a lot of their strategizing, a lot of their public relations and propaganda. The person who wrote the New York Times op-ed, uh, you know, published under the name of Anas Akhani, Taliban are not capable of that kind of sophisticated you know, uh, operation at the international level. So, so whether it's, 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 you know, it's entities to the south of Afghan border or it, whether it's, you know, people, organizations, entities outside of this particular close uh, neighbor, I think that's, uh, that's up to a lot of people's judgments. Uh, but, but the fact that the Taliban actually planned, coordinated, and executed a large-scale military campaign on Helmand, which is in contravention to their U.S. Taliban deal, and they planned two, three weeks after that to do the same thing on Kandahar, tells you a lot about what the kinds of thinkings, what kind of thinking is happening within the ranks of the Taliban, which is, on the one hand, the Taliban living, you know, under air-conditioned hotel rooms with their families, well-paid and well-fed um, in Doha, are talking about the deal. On the other hand, there's, there are significant, discernible, palpable military pressure that goes in contravention to the deal and, and to the pronouncements of the, of the Taliban in Doha. So there is a Doha Taliban, and there seems to be a, a Quetta Taliban, which is a military shura, Mullah, Mullah, uh, Mullah Yaqub, son of the famed Mullah Omar. So, so you can read the tea leaves on that and make your own decision. Uh, but it is pretty clear that the Taliban, uh, this idea of the Taliban being a monolithic, united, uh, non-amorphous uh, entity is coming under increasing a uh, question based on the information that you don't even have to be an intelligence person, private intelligence information to, to conclude on that. But on the other hand, look, uh, the, the, the Afghan National Defense uh, uh, Forces, the our commando, the ANA commandos were able to conduct 98% of their special operations in the last quarter of 2020, completely independent of any kind of US or NATO support, including uh, uh, training or including mentorship or advisory support. We were able to integrate the elements of reconnaissance, of special, uh, uh, special forces intelligence, but also airstrike and planning in 98% of all of our operations. And I think that tells you of what direction the Afghan government is going. And that direction is that we're hoping to talk hard on the table, but also fight hard because we are having to do that. Right. And that means that by developing increasingly independent military capabilities, we're moving in a direction where we can actually be partners with the United States on counterterrorism. Because whether it is the Trump administration or whether it is the next incoming administration, they are going to need a uh, uh, counterterrorism partnership from Afghanistan, which is increasingly independent and more capable. Right. Because the Taliban are not only not divorced of of being in the same bed with Al-Qaeda, because we find them 
multiple times across the country with yeah. the leadership of Al-Qaeda, but also uh, they are pretending to fight ISIS in the East, mm -hmm. but they're in bed with ISIS and with ETIM and with other international terrorist groups up, up in the North. Okay. So for us, this is a, 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 a fight that is going to continue, sadly, unfortunately, unfortunately not by choice, uh, but, but by necessity. But I think are the Taliban a monolithic uh, entity? I think you have, you have a lot of um, independent uh, open source information to make your conclusion on your own. Thank you. Right. Um, uh, Robin Rafael, the question to you is, you know, Ahmed Shaja is, is very clear. He's saying there is one Doha Taliban and then there is the Quetta Shura Taliban. He believes that there is a country south of Afghanistan. He doesn't name it, but I will. It's called Pakistan. And he is saying that it's the Pakistanis, Quetta happens to be in Pakistan, of course, that are still directing this coordination, planning, and execution of this very military and very professional kind of a, a terror or violence that continues to take place. Do you agree? Um, no, I don't agree. I mean, I think if you look at Pakistan now, first of all, they have been helpful in getting the Taliban to the table in Doha. Their goals of late, of the last decade, not talking about the 90s and, and other periods, but I think have remained the same. You know, they do want a stable Afghanistan. They want an Afghanistan that uh, is, has a government that's not unfriendly to them, but they've said time and again, and I do believe them, they do not want a Taliban dominated government in Kabul. You know, they want an end to cross border uh, attacks from Afghanistan into Pakistan. They want access to Central Asia for trade. They want the refugees to be able to go home. Um, they, they want some guarantees, uh, as you often heard them say, against any temptation of India to interfere in Balochistan. I mean, it's a fairly consistent list of what they want, and none of those are served by helping the Taliban attack Kabul University. I just don't, I don't think that that's what's going on here. What I do think is, as I said before, is that there is a window of opportunity that is rapidly closing. I think the reason violence has gone up in part um, is because things didn't happen as quickly as they were supposed to. You know, the negotiations were supposed to begin on the 10th of March, not the 12th of September. So you lost a very important piece of time and people began kind of looking around and, and, you know, getting antsy. Um, and, you know, there's violence on all sides of this. As you've heard uh, Ambassador Khalil Zad, when he calls for an end to violence, he says an end to violence on all sides. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not just the Taliban. So it's, uh, you know, again, I come back to the urgency of getting the political dialogue going. And my hope for the Biden administration is that when they prioritize real diplomacy, that they will be talking not only to the Taliban and to the Afghan government, uh, but to all of the neighbors, Pakistan, of course, but India as well, and China and Russia and Iran, um, because all of these countries really need to believe in a process and in the end result, if it has a chance of sticking. So urgency is, is my byword here. Right. Uh, Ambassador Amar Sinha, two questions to you. Do you uh, believe that, uh, well, the conversation or the talks between the Afghan government and the Taliban are continuing? Slow they may be, but they're still going on while the violence continues. So that's, you know, that's already, um, I'm sure, beginning to um, affect the Afghan government. How much more credible, how much longer can they keep up the, their credibility? That's number one. How do you look at this from Delhi now that there is a Biden, a new Democrat administration in, in the US? How does Delhi look at this sort of unfolding scenario? See, two things. Uh... I would agree with uh, Professor uh, Weinbaum that you know, the, I have no doubts that what is the end game or end state the Taliban would want. What, uh, is, the, what is it? What is this? It is that they would want a reestablishment of the Islamic Emirate. And I think it is very clear from the uh, stray comments that you see from uh, their different leaders. They have not yet come out openly, 
but uh, there have been leaked documents there have been statements by some of them uh, where it's very big clear they may not call it emirate but basically it has the same characteristics as an emirate so they are really seeking power unfortunately the entire process has uh, bestowed a certain premature legitimacy on taliban and that is why you see the uh, the behavior it right? is getting manifested in terms of and of course i also agree that uh, the agreement has given them a license to kill actually there is a huge amount of acceptance of violence against afghans in the uh, february agreement now i don't know the threshold of pain or the threshold of tax that afghan government will pay but anything as spectacular or as barbaric as what is uh, happening or what we have seen in the last couple of weeks uh, they all have potential to derail it uh, i of course as a diplomat and uh, somebody who's really who feels that this is perhaps the best opportunity uh, that was presented to taliban to reintegrate but i also hold the view that taliban is not looking for reintegration in fact because of the status that has been conferred to them it is it looks as if they are pretending to be the government where the rest of islamic republic of taliban has to go and reintegrate the taliban and bring them back uh, at head of the government right uh, so with the new government uh, of of president biden in fact i was uh, watching a, a, a speech of president of senator biden of 1918 uh, 1986 there was a very young uh, senator and this was on the us policy towards south africa in context of uh, Uh, apartheid uh, and i think terrorism the way it is happening is perhaps far worse than apartheid and i just hope that he still remembers what he said and he was very critical of george shul's policy and he said that the policy should be directed at the people of afghanistan and that is the minimum that we should expect and maybe one thing that the us government should do is perhaps draw its own red lines and tell taliban that what is acceptable Uh, within the framework of the agreement because that's the only document we seem to have right now uh, right. and what is not acceptable uh, because otherwise taliban is very good at creating keeping this uh, drama going on in doha while trying to break the will of people and yes. he's absolutely right they are basically trying to prove that your government can't protect you so mm-hmm. you surrender right so uh, emma chuja wants to come in here emma the uh, a comment from you and then i'll come to you dr weinbaum Sure. Um, this was an unplanned set of remarks, so 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 I apologize if I'm taking any of these time. But but this has to be absolutely crystal clear. The Afghan government has long been saying that the primary driver of violence in this country is the Taliban, because they refuse the calls of the UN Security Council for a humanitarian ceasefire. The Afghan government's call for a ceasefire. the oic the organization of islamic conferences call for a ceasefire the ulama's globally their call for a ceasefire and of course the united states call for a reduction in violence leading to a a comprehensive and nationwide ceasefire there is only one side that is perpetuating conflict and violence in this country there's only one side that is blowing up children and women by using ieds across the country indiscriminately which are illegal according to unama and international law they're immoral and ethical under any kind of any kind of laws of war there aren't two sides or all sides to this equation there's one side that is using daily tactics of terrorism there's another side that is trying to defend against those daily tactics of terrorism there's one side that has offered ceasefire unconditional there's another side that is refusing that call from the afghan government from the organization of islamic conference from the un security council from nato and from the united states there's it is it has gotten so egregious it has gotten so egregious that general miller himself had to make a public statement saying that the taliban are driving violence and they have to reduce their violence there are no all sides to this i have to make to make that absolutely clear because this is not just a question of policy this is also a question of morality right uh, dr weinbaum a lot of work it, let me just make this one last comment there's been a lot of work that has made the taliban out to be a political entity that is armed the taliban remain a very dangerous armed islamist militant organization that is active across borders that has to be in in mind when we're all talking about all sides to this conflict but in that case amateur joe why doesn't the afghan government just 
call off the peace talks if you're so angry about what the Taliban is doing with, you know, amplifying this violence across the country. Why don't you just call off the talks? You have to understand, this is the closest we have come to a negotiated peace settlement in, what, 20 years, more than that? So even though there is egregious acts of daily terrorism, there's also an historic opportunity for us to make sure that we make something out of this. And I think the Afghan government and the Afghan people are very clear. The Afghan people want a negotiated settlement uh, on this at this moment. They've been wanting this for many, many years. Up until about six years ago, when President Karzai was talking about uh, the Taliban as being angry brothers, no major national politician in Afghanistan worth his or her salt wanted to have anything to do with talks about with, with peace talks with the Taliban. Six years later, not just the Afghan public is actually firmly behind a negotiated settlement, but so are all national level political figures in this country. There is a consensus and the Republic and the government side for a negotiated settlement, even though there is abhorrence at the daily acts of terrorism right. perpetuated by the Taliban. Okay. Dr. Weinbaum, do you agree with Emir Shahjah's very impassioned comments? And what do you think? You know, like Robin Rafel said, is the window closing? Should the Americans stay or should they withdraw as the uh, timeline uh, spells it out to be? Well, let, let's talk for a moment about uh, American policy now under yeah. uh, Obama, admin, uh, rather a, uh, Trump. a Biden administration. Mm -hmm. uh, I, there's no question that in the broad sense, the U.S. is going to have a more uh, a policy abroad which in, is much more interested in engagement, uh, in alliance building. Uh, it's, it's not going to be receding, disengaging from much of the rest of the world as it has been under the Trump administration. Right. Now, how that translates in Afghanistan is, of course, the issue. Right now, the U.S. is committed to a complete military withdrawal by the end of April. Mm -hmm. uh, the big question is going to be, for me at least, whether because of the continuing terrorist threat, the need for counterterrorism, the need for operations, and the importance of that is that it has to the, uh, I think, the well-being of the Afghan government, whether the United States is going to insist upon their remaining behind here, uh, a contingent of special forces who, together with having access to air power, because that's absolutely critical, are, are prepared to be on the ground and to pursue this counterterrorism agenda. Mm. Uh, the Taliban have made it very clear as a article of faith that foreign troops cannot remain. Uh, it's going to be difficult for them to back off. They refuse to include that possibility in the February agreement. The U.S. tried very hard right. to get that into the agreement. It's not going to happen. However, if the U.S. insists upon it, that will be a deal broker, a breaker at that point. Uh, I, I'm convinced of that. Uh, look, I, I think that the the Taliban at this point in time are very clear in what they want to see happen. And that is they want to see and have been able to achieve legitimacy uh, and international recognition uh, that they could never have dreamed of before. I think they're, they're reveling in this, in this. They enjoy this. Uh, and they will continue to stay with the, this process. But, you know, in answer to uh, 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 Jamal's... Uh, um, Emma Chujah. Emma Chujah's point here, there has to be some point along the way when the Kabul government and the U.S. enough is enough. Uh, we have been watching now the fact that over the course of the time since the, the February agreement, the Taliban, we've been engaging them one way or another. 
they have never on a single significant point yielded. And they have interestingly gotten their way. We've always found ways, face-saving ways, to be able to accommodate them. Uh, we're seeing here on two procedural items, we're seeing that the conference is stymied. We haven't gotten to any of the substantive issues, right. which are so critical to creating a state power sharing uh, and a uh, somehow amalgam of their ideas and, and the ideas of the, of the Afghan people. So at some point, you have to do that. Otherwise, what you're signaling all along here is just how desperate you are for a solution. Call it, you know, last chance. But at some point, you have to make a call. And I think that unless the U.S. and they are prepared to put down some red lines here, uh, that all that's happening now is that in this process, uh, it's making it's weakening our position in in the conference. Uh, I'll add one more thing here. I think that the American role here, as troops draw down to a just a quite a few, uh, just a few, <clears throat> uh, the American position here leverage in 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 the entire affair here is going to diminish unless the U.S. government makes it very clear that it realizes that the U.S. has strategic interests in the region uh, and working together with the Kabul government will take those measures which are necessary to realize those interests. Uh, otherwise, all we're signaling to the, to, the, uh, to the Taliban is that just hang in and you'll get ultimately what you want. Right. Ambassador Riffel, do you agree with Dr. Weinbaum? Well, on some points, I certainly do. Um, the first is on the whole idea of a residual contingent of U.S. troops. Uh, I think there have been signals from the Biden administration and from Biden himself in the past uh, that what we really need is a counterterrorism mission there. Um, now, that was in a different context, but I think, uh, I think that idea remains. And I think that it really is important to start acclimatizing the parties uh, to that likely policy on the part of the Biden administration. Um, I think, uh, I repeat one thing I said what does before. That mean? That I mean, you know, what does that mean on the ground? Are you going to increase the number of troops? Are you going to withdraw? No, 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 it doesn't what mean you, that. You, it means a residual force of, I don't know, you name it, 2,000, 2,500, 4,000, 5,000, but not increasing, not increasing. Well, you have four and a half thousand, you have four and a half thousand US. You know, the truth is nobody knows, except perhaps General Miller, how many troops we actually have there now. It's a sort of a well-kept secret. But my point is that this, this date that the Taliban is counting on of April uh, 2021 that all U.S. troops be gone is simply not re realistic for a number of reasons. The first of which is it was kind of contingent upon negotiations being in process, which were delayed by six months mm -hmm. by actions on both sides, all sides, whatever. Um, so you're already behind the eight ball in terms of those troops. And then the second argument, I think, that needs to be made very strongly to the, to the Taliban is that the key element of that Doha deal is making sure that there are not terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan um, who could, again, plan attacks against the U.S. and its allies. And I don't think that the Taliban can guarantee that without some help. Um, and thus far, I, you know, it's not clear to me that they have. Uh, you know, we read all the reports about Al Qaeda still being strongly ensconced there and so on. So I, I do think that that's something that's gonna have to be adjusted in terms of our approach. And I think that the Biden administration is certainly prepared to do that. Um, in terms of the fight and talk, you know, business, frankly, that's, you know, 
the way of the world. It's not, it's not surprising to me at all. But I think we need to be clearer in our, um, in our understanding, and this means pushing the Taliban, as to what exactly it would take to get a ceasefire. Now, their answer may or may not be acceptable to us, but I think we should really push in terms of understanding what that would take. What do you think it could be? I mean, how do you, um, you know, restart a real negotiation where you give and take in real terms? Okay, end to violence in exchange for what? Very good question, which I think we should pose to the Taliban. But, you know, take, for example, um, the recent article by, by Barney Rubin, where he suggested, you know, maybe it's time to start considering an interim government. Now, I know that's anathema to Kabul, and I understand and appreciate that, but I think we really have to be, you know, push the envelope um, in terms of what it would actually take to get a ceasefire. What do you I think, think a ceasefire is the most important thing to the Afghan right. people at this but point. Do you think a Biden administration would also want to consider something like this, an interim administration where the Taliban also shares power? I, you know, I think it, it's, it needs to be explored, is, is my point. You know, whether they, whether they would or wouldn't, or what terms, you know, maybe that's not the deal. You know, maybe the Taliban want the moon for a ceasefire. Right. But I think we really need to explore that. Okay. Ambassador Amar Sina, what do you think? Do you think that an interim administration in which the Taliban shares power... Um, how does it look from Delhi? Uh, yes, good you raise this. In fact, uh, the increased level of violence uh, is actually going in parallel with this new rhetoric about an interim government. In fact, it started before the elections. It was stated at the level of the Pakistani foreign minister. So these are all signals you have to pick. But they started talking about the Pakistan model first. Uh, then they talked of an interim government. There was a huge pushback from Afghanistan. Now, of course, they have used their proxy, Mr. Hekmatyar. Uh, somebody will say that he's not a proxy of Pakistan. Uh, it'd be tough to believe. Who has now been uh, become the great champion of interim government? So obviously, this violence is basically to break the wind and to make the rest of the world get so fed up that they start looking at an interim government as a better option uh, and perhaps a way forward. Uh, that is the game. The other parallel thing that I see is, again, uh, again from very high-level Pakistani sources who have publicly stated that Taliban should also go as part of the Afghan delegation to the donor conference. Now, that gives it certain more legitimacy. So it is, we have to be really blind to see that what is happening on the ground in terms of battlefield and what is happening politically and how the narrative is being built uh, that... Uh, it is just accident. You know, I think it's a very well uh, thought out design. Um, right. And, and of course, this entire thing of foreign troops and their uh, Taliban, I think I, it reeks of hypocrisy and irony. The foreign troops only which support the Afghan government, the Islamic Republic, need to go out. I don't think nobody has questioned them that what about the foreign fighters and what about the neighboring countries' troops which are fighting along or or foreign troops in the service of jihad is acceptable, but uh, foreign troops uh, supporting the Afghan people seems to be unacceptable. So, well, they are enjoying this moment in the sun. Uh, I don't know how it will, how long it will last. I just hope that this legitimacy, uh, that they have overread the international uh, sort of sentiment that this is not a carte blanche given to Taliban to behave and continue to behave the wish to behave, and they will be brought back to Kabul to establish uh, their own government and an emirate. Uh, I think uh, that should be made fairly clear. So this global narrative has to change. And one can see this. The Europeans are very uh, uh, sort of discomforted by what is happening there because they have a certain commitment of Afghan people to the values. No, the America, are you, so, sorry, can, can I interrupt you here, Ambassador Sina? Yes. Are you saying the Europeans are discomforted about what's happening? Yes, uh, the way legitimacy has been conferred on Taliban, I think it is very clear if you uh, see what they have been uh, stating. No, so what are you uh, saying? That it was just the Americans or the Trump administration ambassador? There was a certain mandate given to, you see, I don't blame. I think the fact that after 20 years, any government would like to reduce its exposure, like to cut down uh, both expenses sure. and the debts, I think that is very legitimate. And, and President Biden would also follow the same. 
but you know it cannot be at the cost of afghanistan or afghan government so we always have to work a different formula uh, and, and this is i think they have india has a big role uh, both as a supporter which has not sort of uh, been hedging its bets in terms of who to uh, what should india do is my question india should of course continue what it is doing that is back the afghan government helps uh, help its capabilities Uh, both defensive as well as developmental uh, capacities in every which way possible, and more importantly, we need to actually articulate a different view, uh, which is perhaps counter to the narrative. We, and that is why you know the third uh, thing that I see that Pakistanis are also saying that the biggest spoilers of this deal are who? Uh, in fact, they are naming Amrullah Saleh, Ghani, India, etc. because they want the world to believe you oh, these guys are the ones who are really derailing the process not once they have said that the excessive level of violence which is a spoiler not once they have said told taliban that you know they are willing to send taliban leaders packing to doha but they have not told them ki okay now shut shop this is a deadline and you go back because they will then link it to the refugee crisis and they know afghan government can't suddenly take uh, care of uh, 3 million or 2.5 million refugees so it's a game which is happening i think we in the region are fairly sort of wise they will create bogies of kashmir and balochistan on balochistan madam rafal i just wanted to say that whole of pakistan is accessible to us uh, because if, as as our territory is accessible to their guys why would we need afghanistan and if we actually have to approach of balochistan through afghanistan there it has to be done in concert with americans and the british so i think the pakistani problem will be much bigger because for 10 years at least helmand kandhar which are bordering areas were all uh, troops of us and america so do you think we'll use balochistan we share land borders with pakistan we have maritime boundary the coast is accessible to us baloch leaders are all over the world so i don't think we have to really be so foolish to do the most obvious thing if we really want to follow a policy on balochistan right we'll talk about it <laughs> in a bit robin do you want to say something i i would just say you know uh intelligence agencies across the world are are often known for doing the most foolish obvious thing so i you know okay. that uh, none of us are any different and i I'd, i'd also like to say uh two other things one just briefly the idea of an interim government long precedes uh this recent spate of violence that idea has been around for quite some time um and the second thing which i think is very important in terms of the legitimacy of the taliban that as easy as the legitimacy can be bequeathed on them by the international community it can be withdrawn um and i think that's an important point Right Dr Weinbaum the question to you is uh, you know ambassador Amir Sir I just talked about Pakistan being a key player it has always been a key player it's it's a yes. yeah you know it's it's a, it's a neighbor a very important neighbor uh, one and a half million afghans still live uh, in pakistan especially around the border but the question to you is should pakistan play a much more obvious role in the uh, peace talks do you think china can be can uh, be persuaded to play a role after all china is a rising power a very very good friend of of pakistan how do you think you know you can sort of well pakistan is playing a major role to the extent that pakistan can pursue its own interests which is understandable i don't think there's any country in the region outside of afghanistan itself that has more at stake in what happens in afghanistan uh their their economies uh are more closely linked uh in populations as well so they have a stake here uh pa- pakistan i believe though has played its role pretty much its role was to bring the taliban to the table uh it was able to do that it had the leverage to be able to do that but what pakistan has learned a long time ago is you can't dictate to the taliban you can you can get them to go so far uh but ultimately their core values are really what determine their policy and this is something that they that they will determine in fact seen in in another sense really 
the international community here and the regional community particularly, as much as they are engaged and have our stakeholders in this one way or another, ultimately the end game here will be determined, whatever it is, by the Afghans themselves. Sure. Uh, they're going to be have, they're going to have to determine uh, whether there is one kind of a government or, or another. Nobody is going to be able to do it for them. Let me say a word about the interim government. If you think about it, to create the interim government would require the same kind of negotiations and, and compromises that you would need for a grand bargain. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not that somehow this is an easy move. They would, they would be fighting over the same, many of the same, uh, around many of the same questions. Uh, it's interesting now with the interim government, who has pushed hardest for the interim government? Has it been the Taliban? No. Although that might be strategically useful for them because they would have a nose in the tent, if you will. Uh, but it's been the opposition to the Kabul government, the political opposition, which has been pushing for the interim government. The Taliban have said, we don't want an interim government. Right. Well, I think that's very honest because they're saying, we don't want to share power in a system which is essentially the old system. We want a new system. Uh, and for them to in effectively, one way or another, join the government, even if Ghani is gone, this interim government, the rules will still remain the constitution as it exists now. Uh, this is anathema to them. So I, uh, I think we have to be you know, realistic about what interim government means here. Uh, if you can get there, you probably could get much farther if, if everybody had goodwill. Right, uh, Emma Chija, I think we're running out of time, so I'm gonna give you the last word. Sure. Well, um, thank you again for organizing this and for running an excellent panel. I really enjoyed uh, everybody's views about this, but I think it is important for us to keep a clear picture of what the Taliban are and what they're doing and contrast that with a legitimate state international actor that is, that is a party to the U.S., to NATO, to the EU, and to the rest of the world. Um, and I think that is something that, that sh you know, uh, it, it, it is remarkable that we have to repeat this. Uh, but I agree with Ambassador Raffel that uh, the same hand that has given you the legitimacy of, you know, plush offices in Doha could take it away. And it could start with the removal of your comp carte blanche to travel, uh, you know, under the exemptions from UN Security Council resolutions. Um, and, and I think what, what the Taliban are telling us by the extremely high unacceptable barbarity of their violence is that they're giving us an opportunity uh, to, to reevaluate the entire setup um, uh, which is so dear to them. But, but even though there is, there is a, a historic opportunity for the Afghan government and the Taliban to make peace, this is also an opportunity for the Taliban to come in, come in from the cold. There is also an extremely large potential for risk that the Taliban would actually overplay their hand. They would overdo what they think is giving them power and leverage, that right. they might do so much violence that, that communities outside of the government, outside of the ANDSF might mobilize. And that is not to the Taliban's advantage. It is not to Afghanistan's advantage. It is not to the advantage of our neighboring countries. It is not to the advantage, <clears throat> excuse me, of NATO and the United States. And so the Taliban, also have an historic opportunity not to miscalculate and not to overplay their hands because this is for the shared future of all Afghans. Thank you. Right. I've just been told by uh, Dawood Muradian, who is the director of the Afghanistan Institute, that we can, um, we can go on for another 10 minutes or so. You all know Dawood. He's a sort of master puppeteer pulling the strings <laughs> while all of us are all over the world, you know, mm -hmm. participating in this session. So, um, Robin, to you. The question of China, which is, you know, rising power, very good friend of, um, of Pakistan, of course, also a neighbor, um, expanding influence in South Asia, but the US and China doesn't have a very good relationship, at least we've seen these last few years. Now, can China be invited or can China be asked to help sort of stabilize the situation 
uh, in Afghanistan? Well, first, I'm, I'm hopeful that the Biden administration will take a bit more of a nuanced view of, of China. I mean, clearly, they're a competitor of ours and, you know, potential adversary, whatever. But I think a nuanced approach, diplomatic approach is, is needed, number one, and I think that will come. But number two, I'm not sure that China has... Uh, a real interest in getting involved in the nitty gritty of the politics of Afghanistan. They have economic interests. I think they'd like to expand the Belt and Road through Afghanistan and so on and so forth. But thus far, they've been hesitant to really um, get deeply engaged in the politics. I think they could be encouraged, um, but I, I wouldn't look to them to make a major difference there. Right. Uh, to, to you, Dr. Weinbaum, I'd like to talk a little bit about Iran, which is another uh, neighbor, uh, a very, very important neighbor of uh, Afghanistan, of course, and Herat is so close to Iran. But if you, if you see, you know, the, as the world changes, Biden is, is going to be the new president. He has promised to reopen the JCPOA. Now, how is, how is a new Biden term going to impact the Iran-Afghanistan relationship, if you like? Can it, can you sort of leverage these ties to help stabilize things? And also, uh, the, and, and, yeah. and sorry to interrupt you, but just yeah. if you could also talk a little bit about Chabahar, uh, you know, mm -hmm. India has, um, has some, has a role there, as well as Gwadar, which is right yeah. next door, where the Chinese have a big yeah. stake. I remind people, of course, that even going back to the Shah's regime, there was an axis between uh, New Delhi and, and Tehran. Uh, so that mutu the mutuality in the relationship has been there for a long time. Uh, and uh, I think that together, both countries really uh, have, have a, an opportunity here for cooperation. I don't see any cooperation in the foreseeable future with the United States. Uh, things have gone too far on that score. Uh, we'll see whether there's uh, any progress to be made at all at reopening negotiations. Uh, it's a pity because if we go back and look at 2001 and so on, we saw the United States and Iran indeed cooperating uh, in the formation of an of a Afghan government. Uh, and uh, we could go into why that fell apart, but certainly there, were, there are there the seeds of, of something because let me point this out that no country in the region would be better served with a Taliban regime or a Taliban dominated regime. No country would. At the same time, if we look at all the countries in the region, they, all of them, uh, cannot realize their aspirations, whether they're economic or political. Uh, they cannot realize those unless there is peace or reasonable stability in Afghanistan. In a way, Afghanistan is the fulcrum here for, for, for driving here the, really, I think, the future of the region. As long as Afghanistan remains as it is now, whether it's the Chinese fully realizing their ambitions or it's, uh, uh, or it's the ability of, you know, of trade to grow uh, and for all of the opportunities here for redevelopment in Afghanistan and beyond, uh, all of it hinges very much now on what happens in Afghanistan. Uh, it's unfortunate, as I said before here, that for all of the interests that the region has, its ability really to sway the direction of things in Afghanistan, that, that influence is so limited. But that's perhaps because the region itself is so divided about Afghanistan. Yes, yes, I think, I think any, any, you hear sometimes people saying, well, you know, if, if they all, they're all together right now, they all, they all really are on the same page now, but uh, it's only for that. They all would be better off with a peace settlement. Uh, but the truth is the rivalries that exist in the region mean that any idea that somehow with the US gone, they will step in together and all be able to, to somehow orchestrate 
peace in the region. I think this is any thoughts along that line are foolhardy. Right. Ambassador uh, Sinha, can you tell me how you look at the days and weeks ahead with the new Biden administration in town? Do you think that things are going to get worse, unfortunately, before they hopefully get better? Well, I guess the period of transition, uh, one can expect it to get worse. Uh, but obviously, uh, given our relationship with uh, Afghanistan and, uh, and our combined relationship with the U.S. and this uh, new Quad and looking at the maritime partnership, we will have to articulate our uh, concerns very uh, clearly. Uh, like what? What do you think your concerns are? And, you know, let's just be a little specific about this. Our concerns are really, India's concerns, I think, are, are shared by Americans, by Europeans, by everybody. It's the concerns of the Afghan people. They don't want to live under the Islamic Emirate. Uh, and, and I think that American policies, if it changes towards Iran and gets slightly more nuanced, I think it will be easier for us to deal uh, in terms of uh, do a number of things which had to be put on hold, uh, especially the connectivity issues, which uh, sort of, breaks this uh, stranglehold that Afghanistan feels it is under. Uh, uh, fact that terrorism uh, still finds support is something that needs to be recognized and, and, and accepted, and we'll have to keep articulating it uh, bilaterally, also at the UN Security Council. Uh, we will have to make it clear that our partnership cannot be compartmentalized as we are great strategic partners, members of Quad in the maritime domain, but on, uh, in northwest of the on the territory, U.S. can have a completely different policy, which really actually affects our uh, security concerns in the long term. And I agree that no regime, including Pakistan, would want a full-blown Taliban uh, government in Kabul. But unfortunately, they don't have an option because they haven't had equities anywhere else outside of Taliban. And, and that is why they're um, driven in this. So I can see, actually, that... Uh, in 10 years from now, there will be a, a book uh, like the bear's trap. There will be American swarm uh, and perhaps even a dragon's cage. All you know, I think the Chinese have already are already too committed to Pakistan. So for them to have an independent Afghan policy, right now it's very difficult. I think their Afghan policy and thinking has been outsourced to the Pakistanis and they hope to manage it. Now, whether they can manage it, uh, there are huge contradictions. I don't have to spell them out. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but but I have a feeling that if the Americans had to withdraw and if Taliban came back, there would be a realignment and convergence of interests. As right now, you see that you know, the interests of various countries has diverged, uh, perhaps different reasons. But I think some of the old uh, partners that we were, we would come back, I think, uh, fully in support of a Republican uh, Afghanistan and at least the Afghan people. And I think the Loya Jirga, the, uh, you can, of course, discount the uh, public survey, uh, surveys that have been done. But nobody, nobody uh, wants an emirate back. And I think this message needs to go to Taliban much more clearly. Even Americans have signed a uh, joint declaration with Russians saying America is not acceptable. Only mm -hmm. thing is they're not articulating it uh, that forcefully. Amit Tija, you have the last word. Why do you think uh, the Americans are not articulating it as forcefully as Amar Sinha wants it to be? Or do you think that they are? And do you think that the Trump administration, Ambassador Zalmay Khalilzad specifically, outsourced America's Afghan strategy to the Pakistanis to a certain extent? And, 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 and sorry, my last question, how do you think the Biden team can manage this better? Sure. Um, I, I, I'm loath to speak on behalf of the United States about you know, their, their position on... How would you like the Biden team to manage this better? But I think it's pretty clear uh, that the United States, not just jointly with Russia, but with the UN Security Council, with NATO, and with other platforms, has consistently uh, voiced opinions that um, is, is opposed to the return of an emirate. I think there is an international consensus. There is no country in the region or beyond that is in favor of the Emirate. Um, even, even Pakistan has come out and said that they prefer uh, the preservation of the gains of the last two decades. I think that is a significant position uh, from, the, from the Pakistanis. Uh, we obviously, in terms of, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of a, a new 
Biden administration, we respect the electoral and transitional process uh, that's ongoing uh, in Washington, D.C. And as, uh, as a key partner, we look forward to working with the incoming administration. Um, our allies and Afghanistan, including the EU and NATO and the United States, we've talked about enforcing conditionality on the Taliban with respect to the Afghanistan peace negotiations. There is ongoing dialogue, but we hope to continue this conversation, the enforcement of conditionality on the Taliban with the incoming administration with renewed vigor because it offers a, a, a natural punctuation point where we can uh, approach this uh, uh, all over again. The Taliban have been brazen in feigning an interest in peace and prosecuting an unprecedented agenda for war. And I think that is something that Afghanistan and all of our allies agree is inconsistent with their commitment, but also the spirit of peace that we all uh, want to see. Uh, Afghanistan is preparing for a zero troop scenario and we are working very hard, um, very uh, diligently and vigorously toward greater military self-sufficiency. Um, we are looking forward to a bilateral dialogue to effect a counterterrorism partnership with the United States in the long term. Uh, NDSF uh, have already been doing the vast, vast majority of the fighting since uh, independently since approximately 2014, 2015. And I said earlier on that the Afghan National Army's Special Forces has been conducting all of their 98%, in, in fact, virtually all, uh, that's virtually all of their effective uh, offensive operations completely independently. Um, yeah, and using integrating Afghan Air Force and surveillance and reconnaissance. So with these kinds of capabilities, uh, Afghanistan is actually looking forward to a fruitful and effective counterterrorism partnership with the United States. And I think right. that the incoming administration is, is an opportunity where we could do that. But not only that, Afghanistan also uh, looks forward to working with the U.S. Uh, during the negotiations to ensure that we reach a peace agreement that protects and builds on our shared gains of the last two decades, including human rights and women's rights, minorities' rights, and of course, our democratic system. Rights and the rights agenda does not get as much emphasis uh, in, in, the, in the popular discourse, but these are important, and Afghanistan is committed to protecting them. Right. As always, Ahmed Shuja very eloquently put, with human rights for everybody, women's rights, minorities, people are allowed to practice their religion. Uh, thank you for your time, all of you. Ambassador Robin Rafel in Washington, D.C., Professor Weinbaum also in Washington, D.C., Ambassador Amar Sinha here with me in Delhi. And of course, uh, thank you so much to you, Dawood Muradian. Thank you for organizing this session for all of us, connecting all of us all over the world. But we are not going to let you off next year in Afghanistan. <laughs>